rip. Um, thanks for coming on the pod, man. I just heard about your music legitimately just last week. Um, my friend Genevieve Hayward turned me on to your stuff, and uh, I, I love I love what you're doing. And um, I kind of dove into your into your kind of social media and 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 back cat- catalog a little bit. It sounds like so you just quit your job at Walgreens because you're getting you're getting so much uh, TikTok views now. You could kind of live off the the social media views. Is that what's up? Oh, uh, no, so I, uh, I quit walking. Well, really what I've been doing for the last two years is trying to build a big enough fan base so that I can get enough streams on, on Spotify, Apple music, Amazon. Um, so I can live off of those. That's what I've been doing really to, I don't know if TikTok really pays enough for any of that. I haven't signed up for any of that stuff, but sure. that'd be nice if they did. <laughs> yeah. Not like YouTube. Right. I wish. I wish uh, that's what a lot of people do. They try to like get everything over from from these other apps over to YouTube because they they pay the creators a little bit more. But not okay. to bash any platforms, but no, I'm no, sure it's... things will change at some point. But and you've witnessed some pretty nice growth over the past two years, just being consistent and stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's what I've been working for. You know, um, I was always just like, man, I don't know if it's ever going to happen. Um, I was doing part-time at Walgreens. So I think I was doing two to three days a week. Um, but when you work in studio city Walgreens, that's enough with the amount of people coming in there and, you know, screaming and flinging their poop around or whatever the hell the, you know, homeless people are doing in there. And then you have lots of Karens coming in and screaming at you because <laughs> they didn't get the right battery they, that they wanted or whatever. But <laughs> oh, so you, you literally and figuratively took a lot of shit there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Damn. definitely. What was your most insane customer? I don't know. You know, it's hard to tell because, you know, uh, I don't know, because uh, you have sa- crazy people that are sane, you know, mm. and then you have, you know, actual crazy people that probably should be in a psych ward because, you know, you live in L.A. and a lot of those people out there, you know, that are homeless, like self-diagnose themselves with lots of drugs and they come in and break into the bathrooms, do lots of like heroin and things like that. And you find right. the needles in there and that that's not fun. But yeah, the craziest customer I had is this guy came in and um, he was like picking his nose and he used the same finger to like use the pin pad. And I thought that was pretty disgusting. Um, But then he started screaming at me about cigarettes. He was like, those aren't the right cigarettes. Those aren't the right cigarettes or whatever. He was screaming at me. And um yeah, and I, I don't know. It, was, it kind of freaked me out, but I'm sure there was crazier ones. But that's the first one that comes to mind. But yeah, man, fun times in LA. That's yeah, <laughs> that's how it yeah. goes over there. Have you had any other weird jobs since you've moved out to used, LA, or just in general? Yeah, I used to work at like uh, Starbucks, and I that one was interesting. Um, I, at the end of the night, I uh, I worked in a little kiosk. You know what I mean? The inside the grocery store, so like the fake Starbucks. And I thought that that would be easier, so I worked at that one. And I um, I would take the like pastries at the end of the night, and you're supposed to like go throw them away. But I would I would go behind the dumpster where the cameras couldn't see you because I'd always park behind there. So I, and I throw them in the trunk of my car, so I'd have some food, you know, for the week. Solid, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to we used to dumpster dive in high school. We would uh, go behind like the bagel store and they would throw out these giant trash bags of bagels, just perfectly good bagels and uh, <laughs> way more than you could consume. But we would end up just, you know, using them as hockey pucks or throwing them at each other. Nice. Nice. When did you That's get great. out to L.A.? You're, you're from Maryland and then you just moved out there to pursue the, the arts and the culture kind of thing. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, I moved to LA from St. Louis. Well, I, I lived, I grew up in St. Louis, moved to Nashville, graduated from Belmont University, got a business degree, got a big boy business job. Um, when I got out of college, then I left that job while I was in LA to just pursue music. I had some retail jobs in between, and as you know, finally quit. And then Maryland, I'm up here because um, I'm I'm recording some songs for a friend, um, doing like guitar stuff. There's like a studio out here that I go to a lot called the Hollow Studio okay um, yeah dude your production is amazing are you doing your own production or you got a producer or what i have a producer named sensu who's very talented i think one of the best producers or at least will be very soon you know as they get some more name recognition but they are they are amazing um they worked with gabriel black and and me and um mark indigo and and uh dole tonight a couple of other artists that i'm friends with um yeah, they're just amazing. But yeah, no, I do. I do my own demos in lot in Logic, and um, 
and a lot of the stuff on TikTok you hear, I'll do my own demos, you know, and then yeah. um, and then I'll throw it over to to Jack to finish that that baby up, you know, and make it yeah, make it pretty. Oh, okay, also, okay. So you use the, the demo as the root track, and then he builds around it. Yeah, sometimes, and then sometimes we just get together, we just start start from scratch together, and start writing together, and like then we'll throw everything into you know reason or logic or whatever we're working in at yeah, the time. Okay. And, yeah. What are your aspirations with, with music then? Have you done much touring or live gigs at all? I, so, um, you know, in college and high school, um, and then right out of college, I did a lot of, a lot of gigs, like with just my acoustic, I'd go around with like a loop station and like, and just do it by myself. Um, I was also in like a really, sh- like, I don't want to say shitty garage band, but you know, it was a shitty little high school garage yeah, everybody band. Everybody does it. Yeah. Yeah. And we, um, we used to go like bar to bar and play and um in the Del Mar loop in St. Louis. We did that a lot. We did all the talent shows, you know. And then um, yeah, no, and then when, we, when I left St. Louis and stuff, you know, I used to do coffee shops and and shitty little bars just by myself. And when COVID hit, I just stopped. You know, I just completely didn't go. I scared that scared the shit out of me is COVID. I I I was definitely one of those people that stayed inside and um, it took me a minute to get back out and yeah, no, I've done, I've done a couple of things like hotel cafe and stuff like that, but, but yeah, no, I want to go touring next year. That's like my main thing. I want to, I want to be like a touring guy and, and do that, do as many as I can. Like that's yeah. my next step, you know? Well, you're um, in a good but, spot. Cause you can, you can yeah. play by yourself or you can hire a band, you know, I haven't obviously seen you play live, but I, I have no doubt in my mind, you'll be, you'll be great as a solo <laughs> person, you know? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No, that's, that's what it's like other than making i feel like other than making like the best records you can like i feel like you know going and playing live and for your fans is like the coolest thing you could do um also nowadays it's like i don't know i mean you can definitely do the touring thing first or whatever and start that way but i feel like it's easier to to create a fan base online and and then make those connections and and Mm. then go out and do the touring i mean um which we'll see i'm gonna go test that next year and see what see what i can do but yeah but you're a smart dude man i mean i i kind of did it the opposite way where you know i've got a few years on you so yeah i just started driving around the country in my shitty car playing shitty diy shows and that was very very magical times and like like boot camp for for live performance you know because you're playing you're playing crusty places you're playing places where you don't have any home court advantage where you have uh you know, apath- apathetic crowds or, or drunk, <laughs> angry punk crowds or, cor- you know, a corporate type audience. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it was definitely a great crash course. But I, I think you're right. If you can spend that time online and really nail in kind of your ethos, your sound. And nowadays with the social media, it just seems like being really consistent, which it seems like you're awesome at. And then boom, all of a sudden you kind of, you can kind of skip, hopefully skip that first step of of dirty work and <laughs> skip, you know, hopefully start above the toilet bowl circuit. Yeah. Right. I mean, and I've done the toilet bowl. Shit. <laughs> you know I mean? I've done it. It's just like, I just probably didn't do it as much as, you know, like an artist just five years ago or whatever. I feel like that was a lot more common to do that. A lot of that before you got some fans in the door, you know, like, right. Yeah. Which who knows, man, maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's still something you really got to do regardless. I, um, I feel like that's this is kind of new territory just being just getting really big really quickly on tiktok you know and um yeah I, I'm, i don't know some artists i'm sure it's harder than others to get to get through the door on a tour but we'll see yeah <laughs> yeah well i think i think you're in a good spot because your tunes are very unique but they also fit into a genre like they kind of in my opinion they kind of fit into that like early 2000s kind of alternative maybe emo world and i think there's totally. like there's already like a a fan base for that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that'll, that'll serve you great. You know, we, we're kind of a, a bit more of like a geek rock band or it's, a, it's just, I feel like I've never felt like a fit into a scene, which kind of, kind of sucks, you know, because uh, it's just harder to connect the dots a little bit, but um, yes, yeah, I'm curious. Cool. I, yes. I'm curious about your, like, um, when did you kind of notice online stuff started, stuff was starting to pop for you? Like what did you, was it just posting a, a lyric video three times a week or when did you notice the things turn for the better? Well, um, at first, well, like I told you, when I first moved to LA, I was just doing like coffee shops and, you know, and bars 
And um, I was not an online person. I actually didn't even have an Instagram like for my shit. Like I had like an old Instagram I never used like from high school, but I never had one for my music or didn't have a TikTok for my music. And then my friend, my friend would send me like, <laughs> I don't know, this is like horrible to say, but my friend was like, he was like, you need to be on TikTok and Instagram if you ever want to make it as an artist. Like that's like step one, like nowadays. And I'm like, okay. And um, so I did it against my will. And I wasn't posting consistently. He was like, if you don't do that, you're never going to get off the ground. And I really wanted to get things off the ground. I wanted to make a living off of my streaming at least, you know, and, and, and uh, that way I can make more, have time to make more music, you know? And like, that was the goal. And like, he was like, this is the only way. Um, And so he started sending me like photos. I like love cats. They're like my favorite thing in the world. Like I, I love them so much. I have two of them or in Rigby. So he would send me like little kittens and he was like, the kitten's going to get it if you don't post today. And I was like, oh my God. Okay, fine. I'll, po- I'll post now. <laughs> um, and so that helped because <laughs> he would, ha- he would just like push me. His, his name's Dole tonight. He's an artist as well. He's on Epitaph Records. He's every time you don't yeah. post a kitten yeah. dies. Exactly. And I was like, okay, all right, I'll post. Don't kill the kitten. I was like, um, so then that started it. And, um, and all I did was like, I would, um, I would like write a song or a verse like almost every day. Um, and then maybe a chorus and then, um, and I would just put it on TikTok and I would make a demo of it. And the demo started getting better and better and better. And my production started getting better and my writing started getting better. And I think what's funny about TikTok is like, um, Cause I think it makes you a better writer because if you're, you have to, if you, if you're doing it this way, which is like, you're writing at least like a verse and a chorus every day and you're, you're making a demo and then you're putting it on TikTok to like show the world, like regardless if it's bad or not, you're getting better as a, like, if, or if it goes or not, you're getting better as a writer, like, and yeah. as a pr- producer. And I think, I think if you look at it that way, it's like TikTok's just a tool to practice. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of cool. Um, and that's what I started doing. And eventually it just works. Like now I do a post every day. So I definitely don't write a song every day, but at least like I try to do it. Like um, if, if one doesn't go, I try to do and like go, I mean, like get a lot of views. Like I'll, I'll still go finish it in the studio if I like it, you know, cause it's important to make art that you like regardless mm-hmm. if people like it or not. But, but yeah, no, I'll, yeah, I'll do like at least maybe one song a week, uh, maybe two and try them out on tiktok i think that's just important i okay. i don't know anyway made me a better writer at least so yeah okay so you just you can test out songs to see right away if they're gonna hit or not and then you kind of give you can pick your greatest hits when you put an album together pretty much but yeah but i also think it's super important to not um let tiktok dictate what you put out like you know what i mean like i definitely think it's a good idea to still finish your shit but yeah i think that's super powerful to like to build your Spotify as quickly as possible. So you can have time to write the things that you think are the most beautiful, you know, and not really care what anybody thinks, but. So when you, know. you notice like a direct correlation, when your TikToks and your Instagram started getting more traction, your, your Spotify went up as well. Yeah. Uh, I, it was like really what it was. It was the intersection of branding um, like, like intentional branding and intentional production and intentional writing so like what i mean by that is like before i was like writing um stuff but it was just like i was just writing to write it was like kind of like i was just going through the motions you know and um and sometimes i would really really care about it but um but and also the tiktok thing it was like i was just going through the motions so like i would just like set up a can camera randomly like my phone camera like somewhere random didn't think about my branding and how it could be cohesive with an entire project and I think once I started thinking about all those things together, it like clicked. So like, I was like, I, I was like, okay, what, like, what would fit with like my actual EP I'm putting together? And I got the clothes that would fit that, you know, and I got, and, and that would fit me personally, you know, like actually being what reflects who I am as an artist on the outside is everything I put together, you know, on TikTok. So the clothing, the um the hair that i've always you have always wanted to have i did that like the it's all important i know it sounds silly but it's all important like in like getting like getting the crtv was was cool because like now i could put all the things that i loved inside of the tv and i thought that fit my music so i had the imagery is like a nuke going off which really fits the end of the world shit that i put on there and like um uh i don't know i put like some tim burton shit because i was doing spooky ass songs that i liked like and 
And I think once you, it, it was much easier to have a brand on TikTok when I got the TV because I could put the sh- branding on there. Or, and then I also started caring about shots. Like, what do my shots look like? And what do, what do they f- make me feel when I look at it? Does this song make me feel like it's nighttime? Okay, I'm going to go shoot this at night with like a, with like one of those, with like white lighting and, and make it look spooky or feel spooky. And once I started doing all those things at once together, and I also really cared about the my own production even i'm though i'm not the best producer so you're my demo, producing it all yeah, by yourself yeah for these tiktoks yeah and okay. then and then once it comes out on spotify then then my very talented producer sense who does crazy shit like he'll put the best drums you can on there and like mm-hmm. different sound designs and things and um definitely better engineer than i am like for vocals and things but but yeah no i think that's what it was uh, yeah <laughs> sorry long no no great yeah. answer man um and then you just kind of tr- you you carry around you shoot on your phone with with a with a photography light or what's your gear? Um, I have like really shitty like ring light um, that's like really cheap and breaks a lot and can hardly hold my phone. And then I have yeah, and I have my iPhone. I used to do it on like an iPhone eight. I upgraded to like an iPhone twelve or something, so that's good. Okay, but but yeah, no, I yeah and but like a lot of times like i'm not really like okay i know that the trend on tiktok um at least it was maybe just a couple of months ago which is like 12 years in tiktok time it was like um people were just doing like very singer songwriter stuff like it and i love that kind of music but i don't think i'm that kind of artist you know like i definitely don't think that's my strong suit so i was just trying to do that constantly is just only do singer song songwriter music and and then i was like you know what i really just I really just want to do like alternative rock music. That's all I've really wanted to do uh, for a long time. Indie, indie rock and stuff like that. And so I was like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to fucking produce it out you know, myself and, and try these out. And once I started doing what I love to do, I think it kind of connects with people more. Yeah. Um, cool. Not that I don't like that kind of music. It's just that. Yeah. No, I, I yeah. I'm picking up where you're, where you're putting down, like, you know, um, there's just yeah i mean there's a there's a million white guys with an acoustic guitar you know <laughs> it's just like i yeah. get it um, yeah i think we all feel that way like yeah definitely when you're holding an acoustic guitar and you go out there everyone kind of feels that way yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah totally yeah, it's a good uh, point um so you said you're putting out you're putting out a little clip of a song or a video every day is that, do you feel like that's sustainable that sounds like s- so much work yeah but also like i feel like touring and and touring every day sounds like a lot of work and almost like unsustainable for someone's mental health but it's like fuck it you know what i mean like this is what i want to do it's an obsession so it's like fucking i'm gonna go on tour and i'm gonna post tiktok every day next year that's what my goal is (laughs) yeah (laughs) whatever it takes dude you know and yeah i don't know if it's sustainable or not but it's it's more like whether it is or not it's like i'm gonna keep doing it because hopefully because it seems to work <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know? and, yeah double um, down if something's working just hit yeah. at it till it till it doesn't you know it's like i agree yeah and I uh i think i mean i can tell you just the amount we play in tour like my bandwidth is just so worn out from like <laughs> if i wasn't on the road i feel like i could really hunker down and like do better at some of this internet stuff and put out yeah. more more social media reels and all that stuff but uh totally yeah the the consumption of cognitive capacity to like promote a show <laughs> just one show it just uh it can really it can really drain you and then like yeah dancing the show hitting up the club hitting up the band all right here's when we're loading in the whole thing so um winter's gonna be nice i'm taking a taking a break from touring and i'm i'm gonna try to bone up on my internet game you know and then your scars look scars will get progressively fancier that's as the right winter goes on and warmer yeah i, like I always that's feel what, uh... i need scarves dude you look pretty cool i need one of those <laughs> Thanks, i don't have I'm, any <laughs> i'm always self-conscious to wear scarves indoors because i don't want to look like i'm trying too hard but it's legitimately bitter cold here and i'm in no i bet so. dude you look sick yeah. though i like it <laughs> I want you look one. sick oh thanks yeah i i saw a man wear a scarf like on stage and i was like that's too much um, but if you're playing outside, <laughs> I feel like that legitimizes it, you know? Yeah. What are your know. thoughts on sunglasses inside? Dude, I love sunglasses inside specifically. And I know it's such a douche move, but it's like, dude, I don't know. You look cool. It's like, why? Well, it's like tattoos, you know? Like, I don't know. Wear your sunglasses inside. Yeah. You know? it's, Just it's not when you're line. like, if you're doing like, I don't know, surgery or something, then don't wear sunglasses inside. But like, yeah, you know, normal places. <laughs> respect yeah. well i feel like yeah i feel like you've you've got your uh 
you know, you don't you don't overdo the the stage costume. I think you've you've got it pretty dialed in. Yeah, no, definitely not usually. Um, however, I think um, it would be really fun to do like a themed thing. You know, like My Chemical Romance does crazy shit. I think that's so they do it the best, probably. That's like super cool. What do you see like your live show being like really theatrical or just gritty and grungy and dirty? <laughs> and for what? What do you see? What's your vision? Well, I've only ever done cringy, dirty, you know what I mean? Or it's just me being me. Um, but yeah, no, for like a tour, that's kind of like a different story. I don't know. I got, especially if you're dropping in an EP, it's like, I kind of want it to be fitting to the EP, which is my EP is doing, it's like, it's, um, it's all about like a guy that like, he goes through the motions of life and he dies and he goes, he wakes up and like, basically, you know, the, like, what is the gate to the afterlife? And he, uh, the whoever the gatekeeper is, decides that he should come back to life and have a, another chance. That he gets reincarnated and he comes back to life, and and then the EP ends with him deciding whether life is worth it or not, and um, and he decides it is. But yeah, so that's kind of like the concept of it all. It's almost done, and so I kind of want to do something where it's like almost like a funeral type you know like an old funeral type theme for the for the for the tour which is just us like wearing like you know like fucking old-timey funeral costumes and shit and i want to wear like a like a black field dress i think that'd be fun and like jump out of like a coffin or something that would I be, think that'd be sick. cool yeah, yeah i don't know Have a coffin on stage <laughs> yeah but it's also fun just to go and play or whatever throw whatever on <laughs> but but yeah do you, do you have a label interest or agents anybody hitting you up trying to sign you I'm um, right now. I'm I'm on APA for my agency. Oh, I know um, those guys. Yeah. Yeah, and um, for labels, yeah, labels. I'm just like trying to decide right now. You know, if I, you know, since there's something to be said about staying independent as long as you can. I don't know. Like that's that's cool and and definitely. Um, I don't know. I don't know. That's a that's a loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> about that kind of stuff, but. Oh, uh, yeah, that seems to be the move. The more you can stay on your own, you know, I mean, obviously take the help where you can get it. But uh, my buddy Devin, I was talking to him and he was in like a, a pretty big uh, nationally touring emo band for, yeah. for years. And he said they were playing huge halls. They were selling like 3000 tickets a night, which is just insane. That's crazy. crazy but he said good. they they owed the label so much money that, you know, they just like the, <laughs> the structure and the deal and paying the lawyer and the manager and the agent, they were all broke despite yeah. they're like, where is this money going? So he's like, you're doing it right, man. I know you're not playing to 3000 people a night, but you got it made. Stay, stay <laughs> DIY as long as you can, you know? Yeah. I think that dude, that's kind of the thing. It's like, I feel like being rich as a musician is obviously you could be actually rich and loaded, but I feel like the, the first thing that actually makes you feel rich is like, just being able to do music, like just being able to do it is like a fucking dream. I don't know. Like that's the spirit. So whatever man. you have to do to do that as long as possible. So well, like freedom, yeah. man. There's no greater currency than freedom, you know? Yeah. And so if you're gonna be in debt your whole life, that's gonna be hard. <laughs> you know, yeah. or whatever. Or at yeah. least for however long you're in the contract. But yeah, no, I mean there's there's definitely something to be said about like, you know, a label coming in and helping you and like and and doing things that you can't do by yourself. Like but and like you said dude it's grueling you know doing everything yourself like it's hard it's not it's not good oh, for your yeah. body but <laughs> dude i had a mental breakdown just last week i just uh went to a oh. field and cried by myself in <laughs> texas and i was like i should really uh hang it up one of these days i mean i think about i fantasize about retirement like i never would i'm i feel like i'm a lifer yeah i've come to i've come too far like all my friends or most of the people I've started with have, have retired from music, you know, which I get, you know, for good reason, because it's just taxing on your your significant yeah. other and your circle and your mental health. Um, but uh, at this point, it's like I've come way too far to uh, to hang it up. You know, I, I could go back to work at McDonald's, but I don't know if that's the move. Not, that not putting worked? that down. I worked there. Yeah. As a, as a young nice. man. Yeah, <laughs> it was pretty fun, actually. Really? What are the McRibs made out of? Do you know that they tell you the secrets? I don't know, man, but I had to take out the toxic waste bin some nights after oh, work, which was like, because I would scrape that? the grill. It's, it's oh, horrifying. Oh, it's from the grill? Yeah, so you scrape the grill off to the side of the grill and it dumps into this pit 
that goes into this big black box oh of toxic God. waste. Did they push you, you in the pit if you're a bad employee? You take too long on your meal break. You could, yeah. You I mean, the... you, if the pit was big enough, you could kill a man in four <laughs> seconds. But I would have to wheel that shit out back by the dumpster in like the hazardous waste uh, zone by the dumpster. And uh, mm. I didn't like look inside, but you could you could smell it from from a mile. It's pretty spooky. No one's looked inside for years. There's like a thing growing in there. It's going to come out one day from under the ground. It's like the, yeah. ground, the, the ground creatures. That sounds like a Ro Capara <laughs> song. <laughs> Maybe we could write one about it. The ground creatures from you know, the McDonald's who, toxic waste. Who knows, man, the chemicals that go into the American food now. It, it's like beyond you don't want to read into it too much, you know, because it's <laughs> it's beyond spooky, like the stuff that's allowed stuff that's like illegal in other countries. We're like, yeah, oh, let's yeah. put that in the beef jerky. That's fine. You always see that like the videos on that on TikTok. There's like tons where it's like, here's what's allowed in the US and not allowed everywhere else. Well, someone Horrible. was telling me like if something says natural flavors on a food item or a can there's like some loophole in the food labeling system where or natural flavors that could mean like any of like 2000 random ingredients oh that somehow God. fit into this folder of natural flavoring i don't know not to uh not branding. to bum you out <laughs> yeah not to bum yeah. you out branding it's good for music bad for food i guess <laughs> just yeah. tell me what's in that fucking food please <laughs> what what yeah. fascinates you so much about the apocalypse and like the end of civilization well, I don't know if it's a fascination as much as it is a uh, real true concern for the next <laughs> 10 to 30 years from now. I don't really know what the timeline is, but it looks scary and it feels scary. And I think I'm just kind of like writing about what makes me feel something in the moment, which is <laughs> fuck, man. I, I don't know. The nukes could go off at any moment. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's how they felt during the Cold War, too. It, maybe not. Maybe a little bit more intense back then. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's just what I felt at the time. Um, same thing like with, with when I wrote employment costs, which was like the first thing that ever allowed me to to you know actually pay some bills and things, you know, for music. Um, that song I was writing because I was working at the shitty jobs I was at, and I fucking hated it, you know. I just, but you know, got to do what you got to do. So yeah, I think it just comes from like from a place of like actual real feelings. Um, as far as like oh the that. Uh, everyone's dying or whatever the grandma song um that just came from like me like wanting to write about like a fictitious town honestly like <laughs> so there was no like fascination of anything it was just like i want to write about a town that feels like it's dying because well i mean it kind of did come from and i feel bad for saying this but like it, it does come from like visiting because like okay see i don't know if about you but like because being wisconsin and stuff I, did you grow up in wisconsin or yeah 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 growing up there it's like you i feel like as a kid you have an idealized version of the place you grew up and then you leave and then um it becomes less and less and less of that really beautiful fantastic place you used to grow up in and and i visited home and it's like you know the laws there on abortion are pretty backwards and the things like that and women's rights and and I don't know, and like, I don't know, the church that I grew up in there, it just seems backwards. And, and you know, you go there and then I start seeing like the town is a little bit more sad than it used to be. And and then I was like, well, that kind of get inspired me to do like a fictitious town. So mm. but anyway, so yeah, I don't know. You asked me about the apocalypse and stuff, but and I just went on a rant about my music, but sorry. Well, you, no, no, you're good. You see that. I mean, like, you know, rural St. Louis or, you know, and we drive all over the Midwest, all over the country and you see yeah. these towns that time forgot and uh sometimes it's cool you know sometimes it's this cute old main street and there's the coffee yeah. shop and the ice cream shop and the little gas station where everyone knows the guy dale who runs it or whatnot <laughs> but then there's dale. then there's like those i mean we just not not too long ago on a previous tour we played like this decrepit like small town in oklahoma that was like sure. clearly a meth town you know there's like yeah. one little street Lots four, of there. four yeah. churches three liquor stores a porn shop like f two bars there's always That's porn the shops who's going in i mean the, the, i don't the, know do they know the internet's like a thing now? <laughs> yeah. they just like don't know about it i guess it's a bizarre when you go on the highway the long highways you know in the midwest there's always the porn shop <laughs> yeah there's like a there's like the the factory outlet dildo store it's yeah decrepit and there's like still three cars in the parking lot somehow so yeah they've been in there for a long for years dude i worked at a used cd dvd store in uh college and uh oh, there was cool. like 
like a little tiny used porno section and like the same <laughs> five guys would come in and like switch out their old porno DVDs. oh my gosh ones, and the... i would have to like wipe them off and yeah, like... no, they're sticky and like <laughs> oh it's brutal you can't open them like anymore they like <laughs> So I would have to do. I would have to deal with these fellas, and uh, you know, no, like no words are exchanged, and they're just kind of like looking at their shoes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, great, great job overall. But um, it's a thing. It's a thing of the past. I don't know if it, you you kind of missed the CD era, maybe a little bit. I definitely no, did not miss it. I miss it actually because Blockbuster. I remember well when I was a kid and like going there, and then, like the Blockbuster guys could like tell you where the like good movies were and stuff and you could talk to them because they were always like really into that shit i don't know i thought that was cool yeah and like getting lost in the in this in the dvd <laughs> store or whatever that was cool but, but i don't know man yeah i almost i almost missed it i was so close i was the you know like as a kid like we had the flip phones you know and then i remember when they switched over to iphones in like middle school or something um Oh and yeah, start, having a flip phone that was friends. a big deal. You know, yeah. you kind of felt like a like a pseudo drug dealer or something, just putting oh, yeah. that thing open and <laughs> taking a call. Yeah, the fifth grade pseudo drug dealer <laughs> that I was. Yeah, I like the ones where they like slide up and you could slide them, and then you could they had the oh, full keyboard. Yeah, yeah. That show was like like a little Mac. baby Nintendo or something. Yeah, you were the coolest person when you had that for sure. Hell yeah! Yeah, I mean, <laughs> who doesn't love a burner phone? Yeah. Of course. I always I lived in Asia for a couple of years, so I always had these weird burner phones because it was like before smartphone technology. So I'd buy these phones for like twelve dollars at like a street stall on the corner next to like a <laughs> couple garbage cans. There'd be like rats running around. It just like the the <laughs> cost it cost me like a, a half a million Vietnam dong, which was like I don't know fourteen bucks or something. Right, <laughs> living in Vietnam. But what was your um what was your childhood growing up? You said you grew up. Did you grow up Catholic? Yeah, grew up Catholic. Okay. Like intensely how, how Catholic. You, know that? you said a church. <laughs> just, I grew up you just Catholic. So. It. <laughs> yeah, St. Oh, Louis. We're also from the Midwest. So yeah. like, I don't know. Maybe everyone's Catholic in the Midwest. But yeah, no, I grew up super Catholic, man. Um, I, I grew up with my two parents as the only child. I don't know if you can tell, but you know, whatever. <laughs> I definitely got a little bit of only child syndrome, but maybe that's good for music. I don't know. So anyway, I would, yeah, I grew up with them too. And like, um, and they they split up when I was like, uh, sorry, I'm getting a call. They split up when I was like uh, in middle school, actually. I don't know who that is. Sorry about that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. No, I, they, they split up in middle school, and um, and or they did, and then um, and then after that, it was kind of intense, kind of shit, you know. Like, um, it was that it was a really hard transition for my mom because she had become you know like a single mother at that point. So I lived with her for a little while, actually, pretty much just her. And then, um, and then I started going back and forth, and that was like an intense time in my life. Um, but you know, maybe at that point, it's like I, I kind of was got into music at that point, so it was kind of an emotional outlet for me, and maybe it made me a better writer. So I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And I grew up at first, I grew up in like suburbia, like uh, we like we grew up. Well, I first I grew up in this really small condo. And then we moved out to suburbia and uh, I lived in that, at like a, like a pretty nice house, like middle-class house where all the lawns are nicely cut, you know, and all the houses look the same. And the dads are always out cutting their lawns with their Lawn shirts guys. off. Yeah. They love their lawns and um, I was trying to outdo each other. And then, yeah. And then I went kind of to live with my mom in like a small condo and we and kind of grew up there and went back and forth eventually between my mom and my dad. That's kind of like my home life. <laughs> That's what you're Are asking, you tight with your yeah. folks now? Yeah, like, I, um, yeah, definitely. I mean, they're super, like, proud of everything, even though, like, you know, even though I'm still a pretty small artist, like, they, they're they super, they're like, fuck, yeah, man, this is sick, you know, like, like, is that how they talk? Fuck, my, yeah, bro, my you're dad, sick, <laughs> my dad's definitely a character, yeah, <laughs> um, for sure. Um, he's, he, like, he, so he grew up with, like, the hippie shit, like, and a lot, like, you know, like, fucking it, traveling with the grateful dead and like you know lots of acid and things like that and so he's definitely out there and then my my mom uh she's just super sweet she's like the sweetest woman ever so yeah no that de definitely chill with my parents at this point in my life 
Oh, all right. That's great to hear, man. Yeah. If yeah. your dad's a character, are you going to like implement him into your uh, social media as a character and stuff? <laughs> well, you know, I did. I did like I did the employment costs. My dad was like in the back. What's that's like a classic like TikTok formula. You have your parents in the back while you like play a song or whatever. You're yeah. showing your parents or whatever. Definitely did a lot of that shit when I first started doing TikTok. But but yeah, man. Yeah, he's definitely. He was. I. He. I think. Like in the video, he's like smoking a cigarette in the back or whatever, just like Solid. vibing to the song. Yeah. Solid. <laughs> yeah, it's. It's. Uh, I always think like Midwest dad, like Red Foreman from that '70s show. Did you ever watch that show? My dad is whatever the opposite of that is. Okay. <laughs> very much the opposite of that. Yeah, I think my grandpa is very much Red Foreman. That's there a good. Go. That's a good show. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. I. I want. I, I would love for my parents to try acid. I feel like that'd be that'd be wild. Like it's definitely like a different childhood growing up yeah. around lots of like drugs and things. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> do, do you um what what do you um where do you aspire to go? Like, is there a spot in the world you really want to play live? Maybe outside of the the classics like Europe and America and Canada. <sighs> Ah, the Red Rocks, really cool place, which I've never been to. I've just seen. I've always wanted to go. Um, yeah, there's no like dream place. Like other, uh, you know what? Oh, actually, the the pageant in St. Louis would be really cool to play, or the Fox out there mm-hmm. is really cool um, with the mezzanines, you know, or whatever, whatever you call those things. The fucking it's a great word, mezzanine. Yeah. What is that shit? The fucking, like a you know balcony? what I'm talking about? Yeah. The balconies. Yeah. Those are cool. Like an old timey theater. I would, I would always want to play. Oh, the those. marquee. Yeah. The marquee. Is that the yeah. same as a mezzanine? I don't know. I feel like I you stand know. on a mezzanine. I don't know. No, you stand on a mezzanine. Both I have a mezzanine words. in the, my song. I sing the word mezzanine. <laughs> yeah, I heard, I heard that. It's a good word. <laughs> good word it's to use. It's a utilize. cool word. I definitely just like saying it randomly as like I was, you know, mouth vomiting while I was writing. Nice. Word. Yeah. Beautiful. And I was like, how do you keep like track of your ideas? You just got like a notes pad in your phone or well, how do you store your like best words and stuff? Ah, uh, yeah. Notes. Notes are like best friend for sure voice memos you know yeah how do you do it yeah i I, the last couple of years i started going to oh obviously the voice memos for melodies and stuff but uh, if i just hear a cool word or a cool phrase out in the wild i just write it in the phone you know nice i just have like pages of just random it's definitely cooler to have like a fucking like a notepad or whatever like no like a book like a journal like a journal yeah yeah, yeah. Like, i mean like i still have the pocket journal. notebook it's in my yeah it's in my ass right now but <laughs> nice. um yeah i tried to do that for a long time and uh yeah it's just too impossible to keep I track lose of them. everything yeah yeah lose i lose and... the notebooks like i have adhd i can't keep track of that <laughs> what's can't... that what's the adhd like does that help you in some ways as and in, inhibit you in others i don't know I don't know. It's, you know, it's done. I've been doing okay so far. So hopefully it's helping. That'd be cool. I don't know. It definitely doesn't help when I have to do like taxes or go vote or something. Definitely like forget about everything. But taxes yeah. are possible. <laughs> yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. It, it hurts in a lot of ways, but maybe it helps with music. I don't know. What, what do you, would you say? Like, do you feel like you're in a good place now? You feel pretty mentally stable and stuff? Uh, I don't know if any musician feels mentally stable. I don't know. I mean, I definitely was a pretty mentally stable person before getting serious about music, but I think music itself is inherently bad for you. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Do you agree? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I know what you mean. Like um, when you're bringing commerce into art, it can all of a sudden start to start to boggle your mental health a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I get that for sure. I, I had Freedy Johnston on the podcast uh, earlier in the year. He's like a he's got he had a hit song in the 90s. He's a he's a legend kind of troubadour guy. But I was in all seriousness, I was like, Freedy, you know, what advice do you give musicians just starting out who want to do it, you know, full time? He's like and he looks at me dead seriously and he's just like, do not do it. Do, don't do it. <laughs> it's bad for you. I just really recommend you don't uh, you don't pursue yeah. music. But um, and I'm laughing and I think he was just being serious. But, oh, no, uh, yeah, it makes sense. Um, I, I, mean, I don't know if I totally agree with that with that logic 100 percent, but I definitely get where he's coming from. Yeah, because I don't know. It's probably really I feel like it's super comparable to a drug. 
like you know like yeah, sure music itself i mean music music as a business itself honestly because that's what it is it's a, it's a business even though it's art and like all you really care about is the art like you have to care about the business in order to make the art so then you just go in that constant loop and it's like well then it's like a it's like a drug because it's like in order to like get your next fix you have to go through like withdrawals and horrible mental states and like whatever i don't know like that's how i see yeah. it and, yeah yeah and that's like the that's the, all the bullshit you have to deal with and do and then like when you obsess i think obsessing over anything is bad right like i mean yeah. if you're completely obsessed with something it's not good like like definitely wouldn't make a healthy relationship to be obsessed with someone right so why would why would the work any differently for music great point um, yeah. yeah well said well said um because there's these highs that are so euphoric and you know, you finish a tour and like all the weights off your shoulders, it feels so good. And you're just like, Oh, I'll just, uh, I'll just make sure I feel like this all the time, you know, (laughs) which is like, you can't, you know, you'll, you'll be at the the top of your mania be like, I'll just, I'll just ride this, this lightning forever. And then you you almost forget like the, the lows are coming on the other side eventually. And that's okay. Yeah, totally. I mean, also like, (laughs) yeah. Like when you see like success and you're like, and and you replace your happiness with whatever like manufactured like dopamine is hitting your brain from mm. like whatever like app you're using spotify soundcloud tiktok instagram any of that shit and like seeing like how people are actually fucking with your art it's like and then you like <laughs> and then you come off of that and you go through a lull period it's like mm. i don't know i don't know it's not good for your brain what does and a I- lull period look like for ro capara <laughs> I think everyone goes through a lull period, like, especially like when they're building, I don't know, a lull period is like when you're like in between songs and you don't know what you're trying to like show people, you know, I feel like, you know, and like, and it's not that you're running out of ideas. It's more, it's more just like, like I was talking, like, I feel like nowadays it's just a way different, like, because you have like, you instantly get feedback, like we were talking about. So like, if my instant feedback isn't good, for like x amount of time not not good but you know whatever it is it's like that's a wolf period and then you get your next one you get your next one that people really fuck with and like that's what helps it, what's unfortunate is like that's what really helps your spotify build really quickly and your apple music and like it's a, it's unfortunate but it's also good you know it's good it's bad it's whatever it is but <laughs> i don't yeah. know it, like i said it helped my writing you know yeah. doing this doing this process helped help my writing so i think that's the good thing that comes from all this and also like being able to all these fucking people being able to like make a living off their music from streaming is like that is like a miracle right i mean that's a miracle like that's crazy yeah i mean like yeah (laughs) i don't have i don't you know what i don't know if i have any like close friends making a living on streaming yeah i've got buddies that survive on touring yeah um but i'm sure some of the more yeah i mean i and you're you're in a little bit younger group so your scene's probably a little bit different and uh, the strategy is probably a lot different it's probably yeah. i would imagine it's like less grind the road immediately and try to totally. figure this internet shit out and that's where the streams come from and that's yeah great. and i definitely think there's something to be said for both because like i think i think they're different from each other i think that like i think once you make it really big on one though like once you're really successful on one i think that they kind of cross over you know like yeah. definitely yeah. definitely a little bit but i i think when you're first starting out like like me literally two years ago it's like i just chose this this path because i was like well i want to make a living from my streaming or from my music and thank fucking god it like it's panning out but it's just like yeah but i don't i definitely think that was way harder to do back even just a few years ago like so hard like and i didn't even know it was possible like thank also thank god i met my producer sensu because he he was the he was making a living from streams and so I was like, fuck, I guess I'll, I'm just going to do that. And then when I do that, I'll be happy. And then when I did that, I wasn't happy. And so whatever the next step is, I'm sure I won't be happy. Like once I go on tour and I'm like selling out tickets for these shows, however long that's going to take, like, I'm sure I won't be happy after that either, but I'm just going to keep going and be addicted to it. Just like the drug. Right. So. I yeah. Well, know. it sounds like for better or worse, it sounds like you got the right brain chemistry to do this full <laughs> on. So, you know. <laughs> If you ever want to commiserate and uh, and vent out your woes, hit me up anytime. You know, I will. I, we can go to a field in Texas and cry. Yeah, we'll hold you, hands. Wait, there's just like a. We should cry. get a field. Of, we should buy a field in Texas. It's called the crying field, and like artists just come there and cry, and they don't talk. That's incredible, dude. I mean, that's a if that's not a bit right there for YouTube <laughs> to go viral. It's a, it's a real thing, you know. Yeah, totally. I agree. We should do it. 
All right, I'll, I'll start looking at land. Maybe it'll have an oil well underneath secretly and we'll get lucky. Oh, yeah. Who are or your the... musical inspirations? Who's like your musical heroes? Um, uh, the Front Bottoms, um, oh, Pine yeah. Grove, The Story So Far, Tame Impala, Cage the Elephant, um, The Beatles, Dr. Dog. Hell those yeah. are all, I love those all are, that shit. Those man. are solid. Yeah. <laughs> Were you ever like a Green Day or a Weezer guy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I fucking love Weezer a lot. Um, Green Day. Um, I listen to every once in a while. I've, I used to a lot more. Um, I like the old Green Day stuff. Yeah, Dookie. You yeah, ever Dookie. To Dookie? That was one of my Dookie. first CDs. Yeah, and... Everybody likes Dookie. Lear- <laughs> Say it ain't so by Weezer yeah. was the reason I started playing guitar. That's hilarious because that was the whole reason I wrote. Um, what was the last song I did? Every er, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Like the whole reason I wrote everything's fine is because I love Say It Ain't So so much. I was like, I'm just gonna like take their chords. <laughs> <laughs> and yes. start singing over them <laughs> yeah well shit i so. gotta listen to that song you made then yeah, yeah it's great how that song just transcends time you know yes it's such a good song it's crazy there's something just well, beautiful about really lazy sounding yes songs you know that's just like total apathy slacker rock i just love that shit it's got a little bit of a groove <laughs> it's not too produced that's just some of my favorite music my i favorite love shit. i love hard-working musicians that play slacker rock like the, i love that paradox me too that's a great paradox yeah i agree ironic but yeah no i think it's um i think what's cool is like about that band specifically weezer is like rivers cuomo he literally writes music the way I made the song that was inspired by by Sid and so, which is like he has an Excel sheet of songs, and I saw I heard this in an interview where it's just like he he like puts down the chords of songs he listens to. He has like vinyl and shit he listens yeah. to, and he'll take the chords and he'll 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 go write them in an Excel sheet or whatever, and he'll come back to them like a week later or a month later and use those chords in a song and just write over them. So he'll like take, he'll just literally take chords from another song, then fucking use them later. I yeah. think that's a really cool way of writing music. That guy goes deep in. Yeah, it sounds, like- <laughs> it sounds sketchy, but you know, by the time you take a chord progression and write your own shit over it, like at the end, the end product is going to be so far from the no, thing yeah. that inspired you chords that you're are for everybody there's yeah. only so many chords yeah yeah <laughs> everyone everyone should take each other's chords that they like chords are sick i don't know absolutely it's like dogs like everyone dogs are for everybody what's your favorite yeah. chord um i don't know that's a great question what is my favorite chord what's your favorite dog um, uh, e major seven maybe i like that i like e major seven yeah that's a okay. good chord it's a little pinky uh yeah, kind of that's that a nice chord. Kilter note. That's a great chord. Yeah. What's your favorite chord? I think it's B seven. I love that kind of <laughs> evil, good. eerie. Chord, I like that. You know? I love B7 the I love the nice. G to the B seven or the uh, the C <laughs> some, to the B. Some guy that just loves chords, listening to your yeah. like, oh yeah, B seven. That's <laughs> yeah. my favorite one. <laughs> I look at the stats and like the listenership just plummets when I start talking about B seven. <laughs> You just talk about B7 for hours. <laughs> yeah. Also a great vitamin. So oh yeah, true. Yeah. B7's got a lot going for it. It's got a <laughs> vitamin business, a cord going. Yeah, lots of things. <laughs> what are your uh what's what's next for you, man, as we as we kind of wind it down here? What's uh what does the next month look like for you? Um, yeah. Um I'm gonna be just TikToking every day, going live every day. And that's, I feel like that's like kind of my touring right now. It's just doing that yeah. shit that you got to do. And I like it sometimes, but sometimes I'm tired of it. And then uh, after that, I'm trying to put out new music. So I got, I'm trying to do like maybe two more singles. I, I got a song better off coming out soon that um, I got some fans that are excited for. And then after that, I'm going to put out maybe one more single, like I said, and then I'm going to put out the EP. Uh, which is that concept EP I was talking about, which I don't even know that's the thing concept EP, but yeah, but it's, uh, but then uh, after that, I want to like tour and like, and promote the EP um, live, you know, and, and go around the, the country. I think that'd be sick. Um, Brilliant, man. Well, yeah. yeah, let me know if I can help you out in the Midwest here. I totally play our ass off over here. So it's kind of our, our zone. <laughs> happy to, yeah. happy to do what I can. Yeah. And this is funny. This we met, this is like us meeting for the first time on a, on your podcast. It's fun. It's great, eh? The pod, <laughs> the pod just it, it's uh 
I recommend to do a pod if you ever feel like it. It really, uh, and it helps you get better at like speaking and, and thinking more efficiently, you know? Yeah, totally. The like just train of thought is different, right? It's just stream of consciousness. Yeah. It yeah, helps with writing. Yeah. I mean, sometimes like I'll, like I've done this long enough where I'll like get on a riff and like have no idea. And like I'll like legitimately black out mid riff and forget what I'm talking about. <laughs> You're and then I'll like, the next come, day. <laughs> I'll come to like toward the yeah. end of the riff and like tie the idea together. And I'll, and I'll like think like, wow, that must have sounded fucked up or terrible and, I, and i'll listen back and it's like a cohesive thought that oh, wow. actually made sense so it's like Good you job. do it you do it long enough and you can actually you know your uh your body and your brain just take over for you when you're uh when it's cool. when, you, when your brain fails you know i like that well cool brother i'll steer people to your tunes i'll uh i'll hype you up as best to my ability as a human yeah. person and uh, i appreciate you coming on man it's great to talk to you you got a you got a great head on your shoulders i think you're gonna thanks. do great thanks man i appreciate you inviting me on here and yeah, like dude. taking the time we'll, to talk uh, to me or wanting to talk to me. That was cool. Course. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, keep trucking, dude. We'll, uh, we'll meet, I'm sure we'll meet up in real life in LA, the land of shattered dreams someday. Yeah, let me know. Hit me up, man. I'll hit you up if I'm through the Midwest too. Thanks, bro. Awesome, brother. Cool. Choo.